All right. Well, small group, the loyal, the few. Um, welcome to week eight. Since I've decided to update my slide to have the right week number on it. <laughs> Other door. That door doesn't open from the outside. All right. Uh, what are we going to cover this week? We are going to be talking about database security, uh, specifically creating users, giving permissions, that kind of stuff. Um, it's about a 15 slide presentation and it's gonna and then I'm gonna do a little demo so you guys actually see how this stuff behaves um, I just finished practicing the demo and while I was in the lab so it should go okay cross my fingers and hope for the best um, but first on first we're gonna get start with the security okay these slides are up so is the PDF as usual they come complement each other or hopefully they do um, the purpose of database security is to ensure that only people that are allowed to touch the data can touch the data and depending on the person's role in an organization they will determine what they are not allowed to do um, depending on the database server not only activities can be authorized but specific times of use uh, some servers not so much um, so when you're developing database security, the first thing I think about is what rights and responsibilities the user have and what should they be allowed to and not do, to do and not to do. And then uh, sometimes you have to enforce the requirements using features from both the database server and the application that you're writing. Um, for example, with database security, um, it has basic security facilities. In other words, it limits actions on specific objects to certain users or groups. Uh, groups are known as roles. Um, and all database servers use username and password security. That's the usual. That's not a mystery. Um, as you can see right here, it says certain objects and certain actions. That means it limits who can touch what and how it's allowed to be touched. In other words, you can set up a user to only be allowed to uh, view records, whereas another user can add records, another one could update records, and a third one could delete user records. Or you can give them a combination of these permissions. Um, and you can control it on certain objects. And some database servers have more fine-grained control than others. And as I discovered when I was pre preparing for this lecture, MySQL security features have actually improved quite dramatically since the last time I did this. Um, it actually has very fine-grained control over what it defines as an object. Okay. Now, the way the model works, and it's a little ERD that just that draws this because it makes sense to use an ERD. Um, a user can belong to one or more roles. A user has permissions, and then an object matches permissions. Um, essentially, everything lives in permissions. The role here, depending on the database server, they either have roles or they have users. Or some database servers like Oracle have both. And database also like Postgres also has both, has both roles and users. You can choose which method you want to enforce. Um, they also have groups, which is another word for a role, just so you know. Um, you guys take taken, I don't know if this group takes a, an operating systems course where you're playing with Linux and you learn about permission masks and, you know, world group owner. Yeah, that. Uh, is that what the pinter is about? <laughs> Anyways, um, database servers, some servers have something similar uh, where you have a set group where a user can belong to a group and the group have the permissions or the user can have direct permissions. Now the permissions control what the user slash group can do. And usually a permission is a combination of a user, an object, and a an actual permission, which could be select, insert, update, delete, uh, grant. There's another one. There's a, there's a whole whack of them. Okay. When you're dealing with security, I love these wall of text slides. 
uh, inherited some of these slides, so I try to make them look pretty as much as I can. Um, security guidelines. You should run your database server behind a firewall. I think that goes without saying. It doesn't mean the firewall needs to be on the machine that the database server is on. It just means it needs to be on a protected network so that somebody on the internet can't connect to your database server directly because that's not good. Just putting it out there. Letting an open port like 3306 open on your web server and the world can hit it is begging for you to be compromised. And uh, there's some people that just spend their days looking for stuff like this because they have nothing else better to do while they live in their mother's basement. And it's just stupid. Um, so even firewalls can be breached because, you know, if you have, don't have good rules, you're doomed. But you should at least have a firewall in place. Uh, apply the latest operating system and the database server service packs. In other words, keep all your software up to date because there's a reason they release updates. Usually it's to fix holes and to fix bugs. And normally bugs can cause holes. So it's good. Keep your stuff up to date. Um, use the least functionality possible. We all know how wonderful Windows used to be. Uh, by wonderful, I'm being sarcastic. Where you'd install base, base version of Windows and it was totally wide open to the world. There was no security, no firewall. Every possible service was on and running. It was horrifying. Uh, Linux used to be a lot like that too before people took security seriously. So, in other words, support the fewest networking protocols possible. Most database servers allow more than one way to connect. Uh, either you can connect using TCP IP, uh, some of them have their own protocols, some of them allow local pipe, which that means that it's actually um, you know on Linux where you have a file that's not really a file? It's actually like a pointer of file that points at a device. Well, the, they have something called file system pipes where there is a file on the disk and you send the commands to that file and the database server executes anything it sees coming in and out of that pipe. Um, so as you can see, there's three alone right there. But also if you think about networking, I do allow uh, SSL encrypted, non-SSL, all these different kinds of encryption algorithms. The fewer you have, the less holes you have. So you pick the one or two that you need, disable everything else. Um, get rid of anything that's not necessary. Uh, there's most database servers installed with some system uh, procedures. And if you don't need them, get rid of them. Uh, if you don't know what they do, don't delete them. Just putting it out there. Um, if you're going to delete something and you're not sure what it does, do you know spend five minutes with Google first? Because uh, I don't want to say Dan said, well, I could delete whatever I wanted because that's not true. Um, disable defaults. For example, MAMP and WAMP and XAMP, right? WAMP installs and you got a pass username of root and a password of root. Congratulations, everybody knows your root password. XAMP's even better. It's root with no password. Um, you install a Postgres server on Linux, for example. It's not MySQL, but you install Postgres on Linux. It creates a Postgres user. The good news is they're smart. The Postgres user doesn't have a password because you can't log in as that user. Unless you change one option in a control file, then it's wide open and there's not even a password. In you go. Uh, but you can't delete that user. You just have to make it more secure. Um, in other words, disable guest is bad. Uh, a lot of Linux operating systems now ship with guest as a guest account. Windows, they all have the guest user built in now, right? At least Windows 10 does. Uh, there's an easy turnoff for that. Uh, Windows servers, finally, they don't ship with a guest account. They used to have a guest account for years. Now there's no longer a guest account in the latest version of the Windows server. Uh, but you should get rid of them. Um, and this one should go without saying, unless the person knows what they're doing and it's absolutely required for their job, don't let them connect to the database server directly. That means you don't give the manager of MySQL Workbench and say, here, just connect to this and type in your own commands. I don't know if that strikes you as a bad idea or as a good idea, but let me tell you, it's not a good idea. 
Don't let anybody who doesn't need to use direct access, don't let them have it. And in an organization, how many people actually need direct access to the database server? The database administrator is about it. Um, but where I work, there's two of us that have access to the database servers directly. Actually, there's two other guys that could if they really wanted to, but that's, you know, they have to open up a document that's password protected so they can get in. Bus theory, right? If Dan and Chad get hit by a bus, who's going to replace us? So we have to have someone that can take over so that data isn't hidden away forever. Um, protect the computer that runs the database server. Um, if the database server is running on a server, a person should not be allowed to sit at the keyboard and type. Once it's up and running, you should not be allowed to typey typey at the server unless something's gone horribly wrong, as in a hard disk failed, computer's not booting, that kind of thing. Um, ideally, the database server should be hidden in a, lo in a locked server room somewhere, or at least locked to a rack. Um, place I used to work at years ago had a break and enter. They grabbed every computer in the building. The server room was wide open because they trusted the employees. They literally grabbed every computer except for the one server that was bolted to the rack. And they tried. The frame on the rack of the server was bent. They, they laid on it trying to break the bolts off. Um, how long did that take them? 20 minutes to clean out the office. They, they left with about 35 computers. Didn't take the keyboards, didn't take the monitors, they just wanted the computers. Most of them were crap. You know, there was source code and there was stuff like that. So the database server should be behind a secured door. Why? Because for most organizations, it's the lifeblood of the organization. And they have access to all your customer information, all your employees' information, any little thing doodad that they might know, all the invoices, all the accounting, all the new financials. Um, it's usually all in the database servers, so you want to keep that hidden. Um, this one here, depending on the size of the company, goes with this one. Uh, access to the room that has the server probably wants to be controlled with a key card. That way you know who's been opening and closing the door. Uh, where I work, we don't have that. We just have a key and there's only three people that have a key that can open that door. So if the door has been left open, we know one of three people did it. Um, but they really run off the servers, they can just punch out a hole through the drywall and get in anyways, but you know, it's one of those things. Well, at least we make it a little harder for them. All right, this is closer to what this lecture is about. Managing accounts and password. For the actual service, you should use a less than privileged user. Minimum privileges are required. Um, this one should also go without saying, use strong passwords. If you use the word password or one, two, three, four, five as your database server password, you deserve to have your stuff stolen. Just putting it out there. Um, monitor failed login attempts. If you server set up right, every time somebody fails a login, it gets written to a log file somewhere. And there are log watching tools where you can say, watch for these keywords. And if you have enough keywords happening of this kind, send an alert. Um, there's a popular one on Linux called fail to ban. And you set up basic rules. And if this rules get breached, it actually bans the IP address trying to connect. Or it bans the computer trying to connect. Or it log the person off the machine. Uh, it's kind of cool. Work kind of works well. Um, you should do auditing every once in a while for groups and role membership as in. Every once in a while you should look, see what users are active and not active because, you know, somebody might have left the company, got turfed. They left and their accounts are still floating around. Um, that's just common sense to clean that up. Um, audit accounts with null passwords. In other words, you should check, make sure you can't log in without a password. Um, yes, yeah, sign accounts with the lowest privilege as possible. I'll explain to that in a minute. Um, limit DBA account privileges. Uh, that one's a little contested. There always has to be one user has everything. It only makes sense, right? I mean, if you don't have one user that can give create other users, you've got problems. 
But in a large organization like the government, for example, they have Oracle servers running on mainframes or on huge iron. And a DBA from one division shouldn't be able to access the database from another division, which means when the permissions are created, they give permissions full control of that given database to one comp one person, but they can't see the databases that belong to other divisions. So that's what that means. You want to limit the DB account privileges, as in don't give more access than you need to. Um, so as always, just like the backups, develop a plan. In other words, you want to take the time and detect um, intrusions. And then what are the steps to follow up with intrusions? In other words, hey, we noticed that uh, Frank has been trying to connect to that server five, five times a day, every day at 10 to noon. Why is Frank trying to connect every day at that time? And he's failing every time. Maybe he's just using an old app with old credentials. Who knows, right? But you should go find out why. Um, create procedures for security emergencies and practice them. So a security emergency could be somebody has breached your network. How fast can you shut down the database server so they can't get at them? You have an employee that's suddenly gone south, as the old American expression, somebody went postal. And you need to shut stuff down because he's on his way to the server room to delete the data off the server. Rogue administrator. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the story about the guy in, was it San Francisco, who was the DBA for the city? And then they fired him? Then he changed all the passwords before he left? And nothing worked anymore? So the city was actually on its knees for days? In the end, the guy was charged with cyber terrorism? Good job. Uh, because he was being wrongfully dismissed, so that's why he decided to be take punitive actions before he walked out the door. Um, I would call that a security emergency. As in, if you're tripping someone, that's an emergency that you should kill other access before you tell them they're fired. Um, yeah, the terminal, tell them. Yeah, well, that almost happened to us a couple of weeks ago where, where we, tur we turfed someone and my boss said, yeah, when can you guys do this? I can do it whenever you want. How about 10 minutes from now? God, we haven't done these procedures in a year and a half. Hold on. You know, that could give me, give me 15. Um, because he wasn't supposed, the guy wasn't supposed to come in that day. He was off sick. He was supposed to come in the next day. And then he came in that day and he decided, short term. Um, practice your practice them. In other words, if you know there's a breach on the network, how fast can you disable the server? Um, ideally, there's a few ways you can handle that. If you have a networking breach and you know you can turn off the server room, our server room, for example, has a remote power switch. Uh, we have a, there's a basically a, a, a little web app. We open up an IP address. We go, turn it off. And it shuts down the entire rack. Sends a power down signal to all the servers and the servers just turn themselves off one after another. Usually it takes about 30 seconds. Uh, we make sure the database server is the first one to get the message because that, that would be bad. Um, all right. All right, there's application security. So every once in a while the database server has limits. The most database servers can't control when somebody can connect. Uh, they can't control where they're connecting. Well, that's not true. They can control where they're connecting from as in a networking address. But if they're VPN in from a remote location, you might not know where they are. Whereas with an application, there's a way of detecting where the person is actually coming from. Um, so sometimes you have to have extra code. Often for web apps, it's provided by the web server. Uh, for example, that if you have a web app, the web app uses only a single user to connect to the database server. So how do you control what each of the individual people can see? Application level security. So sometimes you have to write the security, you have to bake the security into the product. It sits on top of the database server, but you know, the database server has limits. Um, however, if you can use the database server's security first, anybody want to take a guess why? You should at least try to trust the database server first.
Yeah, in case they don't work, because programmers suck. As a developer, I often find holes in my code. And, you know, you wonder, what the heck was I thinking that day? Did I not have enough coffee? Did I have too much coffee? Did I drink that awful Starbucks crap? You know, you wonder. Because um, the closer the, the enforcement is to the data, uh, the less chance there is for an infiltration. In other words, if the database server is controlling what can happen, that means they can't exploit the application because the database server is controlling it. And if it's they can exploit the application, which is why web apps are so dangerous. Like I said, most web apps use a single user to connect to the server. And that means that that user, if it has full permissions to access the database server and your web app gets compromised in the end, the hacker manages to get your username and your password and gets a backup of your database, he's got the keys to the kingdom all in one step. Don't break your earphones. Um, also, the database security is faster and cheaper. Uh, in other words, if it's happening at the database server and the person can't connect at all, it's cheap. If the person can't do inserts and updates, but he can do view a select data out of the database, the server's taken care of, that means you don't have the security grinding through some horribly written Java app. So you guys are Python people, right? Find some horribly written Python app. Because Python can be just as bad as Java. Um, so can PHP, let's just say. All languages can be bad. But the database server has it built in, baked in there for the security will be better if you do it at the database level, because the closer it is to the source, the safer it is. That means you don't have a networking protocol that they can intercept. They don't have an application they can intercept. It also protects you against social engineering. Do you guys know what social engineering is? Some of you do, some of you don't. Well, okay, when I was my, doing my co-op in college, this is 20 years ago, I got hired by a company called Bort Longyear. And for those of you that don't know who Bort Longyear is, it's a division of De Beers International. For those of you that don't know who De Beers is, diamonds. And Bort Longyear did drilling equipment, deep core drilling equipment and mining equipment that looked like something out of an anime tank movie. Like this, some of this equipment was horrifyingly complex. Well, they were finally rolling out technology. In other words, accounting was no longer done on paper. Stuff like that. So they decided that they were going to audit people's understanding of network security. So they had me go outside the building, across to the road, use a payphone and call the receptionist. And I said, yeah, it's Dan from Techsport. Uh, can I get, I'm trying to, I'm auditing people's security. Can you give me your password? And she gave me your password. That's social engineering. Nowadays, it's a little harder to do that, but it's not that hard. People are dumb. Or you'll go to a front desk and they ask the receptionist, is such such here? And she says, well, I don't know, I'll go check. They walk away, you reach behind their desk, you can guarantee they got three passwords taped to the side of their monitor because they can't remember their password. And I've gotten mad at a receptionist for that because she had her passwords right there stuck to the side of her screen. Anybody walking through the door can see her, all the passwords, all her passwords. So when the database server maintains a security that, that protects you a bit from the social engineering side of the deal because you don't get the application level passwords. All right. So, the principle of least privilege. Now, first of all, describe the word privilege. Privilege is what you are allowed to do. Like I said earlier, privilege can be insert, update, or delete, or create, or there's all kinds of permissions you can give. A user or a process should have the lowest level of privilege required to do their job. That means, um, well, that's pretty much self-explanatory, right? If you're not allowed to do something, you shouldn't be allowed to do it. Imagine if all of you were allowed to log into the school system and change your student records. Hot damn, A pluses for everyone. But, right, as network users, you should not have that right. When you log into Access, for example, when I log into Access, it looks completely different from yours. Why? Because they can upload grades and submit grades, which you guys obviously cannot do. You can look at your grades. But my privileges are different from yours. So the rule is you identify 
the bare minimum a person needs to do their job. And then you find out if there's anything a little outside the ordinary they need to be able to do, and you only give them that. In other words, the very bare minimum to get the job done is what you give them. And normally that means your data is going to be a little bit safer because you can't have rogue users nuking tables or creating new tables or exporting your data. Um, depending on the database server, you can control data exports, that kind of stuff. Um, any questions about this stuff so far? It's pretty, the concepts are pretty straightforward. It's just, you know, a lot of words that talk, repeat themselves. Okay. Grant and revoke. Now, well, that's a cool question mark. That's not supposed to be there. Grant. Uh, depending on the database server, the grant command can be used to create users. Uh, on some others, you can't. But the grant command is used to give people permission. I grant you rights to the database server. I'm magnanimous, and I will grant you permissions to do things. And then I can turn around and say, I revoke your rights. Thou shalt not select data today. Um, <clears throat> now, some of the common privileges you'll see is all. I think that's pretty obvious. Keys to the kingdom. They're allowed to do whatever the heck they want. Uh, select means you can retrieve data. Insert, update, and delete. Well, these are each independent of each other. But you can say, this user is allowed to add data to the database. This user is allowed to delete data from the database, but they're not allowed to do both. In other words, you could create a user for the average office administrator. Then you create another user for a manager where they can decide, oh, that order is wrong. We can delete that order. So when that manager connects, it uses the slightly more elevated privileges. Um, create, alter, and drop. Uh, the average database user should not have these. These are DBA level permissions. In other words, you don't want your application creating tables for you, which is where the whole web app thing goes horribly wrong. Because in most web apps, so for example, WordPress. Anybody here ever use WordPress? Okay, one. Tough audience. Um, trying to think of something else somebody might have installed. Anybody here have their own web server, uh, their own websites other than, okay, a couple, three, four. When you install a CMS, for example, whether it's Joomla, WordPress, Drupal, whatever, it asks you, give me a user that has database administrator privileges. And it actually writes that in the config file, and that's the user it uses forever after that. And what happens is as you install the CMS, it creates all the tables and populates them. Then you install WordPress, for example, you install a plugin for forums. It'll create half a dozen tables. It needs an administrator level privileged user to create the tables. And then your administrator level user gets compromised and then they have access to your database and they know everything about your users. Um, web apps are notoriously bad for that. Well-written web apps will actually have multiple connection methods depending on what kind of, if you're logged in as an administrative user, it'll allow you to do these things, but if you're logged in as a normal user, you're allowed to do these things. Well, that's a good clicker. Um, then there's one last one called usage. Uh, MySQL does not have the usage one. That one comes from other database servers, and it basically means that there are no privileges. They're allowed to connect, and that's it. They're not allowed to do anything else. Not a very useful permission, but uh, let's say you have um, a database server where when the person goes to log in initially, it needs to make sure the server's allowed. It'll use, I mean, is it live? It'll connect using a usage user to make sure the server's live. So then you can then log in as a privileged user. That's its purpose. Okay. Now this stuff is now specific to MySQL. So create user is the first command you want to think about. Create user, and those are single quotes. Username at host, identified by password. Uh, in MySQL, usernames can be 16 characters long. So your username can be 16 characters long. Um, the host can be a local host, a fully qualified domain name, 
those of you that might be taking networking, you should know what FQ, FQDN is by now. Uh, an IP address or a wildcard, uh, percent sign is the wildcard because MySQL uses a like statement. That when it goes to check the permissions on the user, it's kind of special. It uses SQL to determine SQL privileges. Um, if, for example, if I put in 192.168.1 percent sign means anybody on that subnet who have 168, uh, 192.168.1 can connect that machine, but nobody outside that subnet can connect. Um, remember when I was talking about least privileges earlier and limiting, you know, where people can connect from? This is bad. This is almost as bad. Um, you should always set up your permissions for a user to connect to from a host. Uh, for example, connect from local host. That means that web app can only connect from itself and only that. Or normally servers have static IP addresses. That means your one, the web server could be 192.168.1.20 is the web server and the database server sitting at 25. In there you'd set up saying dot one dot twenty is allowed to connect. Period. So you're saying this connection, this user can connect from here and only from here. It's the safest way of connecting, obviously, because if you have you can, if the person can't connect from another machine, that means it's one less hole in your security. Okay. The grant syntax is grant privileges on whatever to some user. And if you put in the keyword identified by password, it'll actually create the user on the fly. Uh, some of you have already tried doing this, and MySQL is in the process of deprecating that syntax. Thus, it's showing up there with as an optional parameter. Uh, the, next, the next major version of MySQL will no longer support creating a user on the fly with the grant command. Why? Because it's bad. You shouldn't do that anyways. Imagine you're sitting there trying to grant permissions to someone and you mistype their username. So then you just created some new user that has a password that has permissions and who knows. Um, there's one last argument with grant option. That means you can actually give a user the rights to give rights to someone else. Uh, does that strike anybody here as a good idea? To give anybody the rights to... So I create a user for you, with the ability to give permissions, you can give permissions to him, to her, to him, to him, to him, to everybody in the room. Or you could create a generic user called Bob. With And then you can give Bob the complete keys of the kingdom to every database. Yeah, with grant options, not a good one to give. Um, but an example here is grant all on dbmusic.star. That says it's going to give all permissions to a database called that db music dot star means all tables inside db music so the database is called db music dot star identifies all the tables so if i wanted to get permissions to only one table i'd go db music dot songs for example and that would limit the permission for that one table uh, to the user and identified by whatever um, this is the generic syntax by the way MySQL syntax is a little different from this, but this is the generic grant syntax so that in most servers, this will work. It'll work in Postgres, it'll work in Microsoft SQL Server, it'll work in Oracle. In MySQL, the syntax is tiny little bit different. Which that PDF I gave is that's on Blackboard, the whatever it is, the security PDF, has the MySQL specific syntax in it. The revoke syntax, so today you shall not. And you revoke the privilege on the object from a given user. And again, revoke insert on DB music from DB user. That means that that user, DB user cannot add any more records. It's only, but he can still update and delete, but he can't add. You'd have to remove update, then remove delete also. Okay. In MySQL, if you want to change a, another user's password, not your own, but another user's password, for example, somebody's being walked out the door, 
and you want to make sure their user is dead as a doorknob. You'd connect to the MySQL database and you issue a command update user set password equal to password whatever it's supposed to be where the user is equal to their username. This is MySQL specific syntax. Uh, the password command uses whatever da password hashing routine that MySQL's got going at that point in time. Uh, right now, if I remember right, it's SHA1, which is soon to be deprecated to SHA256. Just we keep updating the cipher because people keep figuring out the rainbow tables for each of the ciphers. Uh, where users equal to whatever, and if you do this command, you can change the person's password like that. But that means you have to have access to the MySQL database. Not the MySQL database server. In MySQL, there's always a database called MySQL. And that's where the users are stored, and the permissions are stored, and the access rights are stored. So you have to have access to the actual system level database to do this. If you don't have access to the system level database, which you shouldn't unless you're the DDA, you know. Okay. Okay, and once again, make sure your MySQL database is secure, least privilege. As always, grant only privileges that actually needed for each user. That's a review from 10 minutes ago. Grant access from the hosts that they'll be connecting from, as I discussed with MySQL. You don't want to use wildcards if you can absolutely avoid it. Uh, why? Because that means any computer connected to the network can hit the server, and that's not good. Um, especially if you have unprotected Wi-Fi on your network, which I've seen. Like our neighbors next door, which I won't name the company, but they do embroidery. Every once in a while, our Wi-Fi goes down, so I use theirs. And I can see every computer on their network. So I used to, and then I walked over a couple of days ago, and I knocked on their door, because, you know, all the doors are locked, and they go, what can I have? I say, yeah, your Wi-Fi is fantastic. He goes, are you able to connect? I go, yeah, you might want to change your password. Actually put a password on it. They're like, how do you do that? Hey, go get me a Tim Hortons coffee and I'll fix it for you. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, I still don't know what their password is, but I had, I sat there with someone that typed in a password. I showed them how to do it. <laughs> hey, they do embroidery. They put like logos on shirts and stuff. They're not an IT company, right? So I'm guessing they just brought a, somebody brought a Wi-Fi router from home so they could use their phones. Um... So only give permissions from the hosts that are going to be connecting. That way you avoid stuff, bad stuff. All right. The last important thing about MySQL is your passwords. Never use a blank password, duh. Why should you never use a blank password? Because then there's no password. Dash U space root. No password argument. In the door you go. Um... Should be complex. I think that's pretty straightforward, right? By nowadays, complex passwords are a thing. And if you don't have a complex, if you can't come up with a complex password, there's lots of websites that'll just go, give me a password that's really hard. Sure. Uh, if they didn't blog every password they generated, it'd be fantastic. But they do. Um, so, but you use a really complex password that gener that basically in human impossible to type, that means you're storing the password somewhere safe. Um, I do have a website somewhere, and I wish I could remember what it was called, I'd pass share it with you guys. It's It actually generates a password that's really complex but easy to remember. It follows a pattern. So it'll be like a dash and a tilde, then a three-letter word, then a, then a pipe, then a five-letter word, then a pipe, three-letter word, then a dash and a tilde. It's actually a pattern. And you can choose which characters they use and how big each of the words are going to be and the dividers and stuff like that. So you can figure what it looks like, but it's as long as you remember the first little bit and you remember the words, you can always remember the passwords. Um, but complex passwords are good. And always encrypt the passwords using the password functionality. Uh, used to be MySQL used MD5 to secure their passwords, and that's no good anymore. Now they were using SHA1. And that's no good anymore. Um, there's a variety of things that are causing grief. Um, but if you use the password function, that means the passwords are always kept up to date. And they're, this is a one-way encryption. Um, did you guys learn anything about hashes? 
That's something you should know a little bit about so you understand. Okay? Salt in the hash. Uh, but specifically, a hash is a checksum. So you hear about people, I encrypted my password, right? And there's, encrypted in this case is badly used. And encryption is you take so, a piece of data, you run it through a cipher, it becomes gobbledygook, you run it through the same cipher in reverse, and you can now access the data. That's encryption. A hash is a one-way trip. It's a fingerprint of the data. In other words, uh, there's one called MD5. It used to be really popular till about uh, six or seven years ago. And you can do an MD5 of a file, and that will give you a 16, if I remember right, 16-character hex string that identifies a fingerprint of this file. You could give it a six-letter word, and it would still give you a 16-character hex pattern that matches that word. That's a hash. And the reason people use hashes for passwords means that you can't, somebody connects to the database and dumps the user table, all they see is hashes for the passwords. They don't see passwords in clear text. Um, the bad news is if you're using MD5 as your password hash, um, there's something called rainbow tables. And the rainbow tables is somebody took a really powerful set of computers and they generated every possible combination of characters that people could use for a password. And they, they, they didn't stop at like eight characters. They went out to 128 characters. So essentially, if they dump a file and they see the hash, they'll load up these hashes and compare them to the values in this database. By the way, you can just do a select statement because it's, it's an SQL database. And you'll see a string that will work as that person's password. It might not be the person's original password, but it's a string that has the same checksum. Then you have passwords. And you can usually, if the people don't use salting, which he brought up, salting means you add just a random little bit to the password so that it's a little harder to, to figure out what the pattern is. The hashes are good. You want to use a really secure hash. Uh, current popular ones are uh, SHA 256. Uh, that means it's 256 bits of, of uniqueness. Um, and Blowfish is another popular one right now. Blowfish is actually a two-way one, which is kind of dangerous. Um, there's a couple of others that are more secure than those. Uh, but right now, SHA-256, uh, the, ha the rainbow tables are only up to five characters long right now. So if your password is more than five characters, you're probably okay. Um, it's just, you know, 256 bits is an awful lot of comparison you have to do. And they're using uh, video cards to generate the numbers. OpenCL. Okay, now it's demo time. All right, so for starters, I am going to. Um, oh, and I lost it. Where did it go? There it is. So the first thing I want to do is actually I want to create a user so that I can, um, well, obviously connect to the database. And I'm going to create a user called Dave. And if I try to connect using Dave, so I go so a user called Dave. And because Hello, oh, bin, duh. Let me get this up here because I can't see what I'm doing. So you'll see there's a user called Dave at localhost. Nothing has been allowed to connect. And such is life. Nothing works because I'm not allowed to connect. So what I want to do is I want to create a user. And the syntax for creating the user looks like this. So this is something I've shown you guys on the other screen. Let me make this bigger. Create user. So here we go. That's the command is create user. That's the username. That's the host name. As you can see, I'm only allowing to connect from local host. It's going to be identified by a password of Dave, written in Leetspeak. And I'm going to hit run. Now, 
By the way, I'm using the MySQL database. So if you have, you're not in the MySQL database, first, issue that command. Then away you go. So use MySQL. I now have a user called Dave. And allow me to try to connect one more time using the user Dave. Access denied for user Dave at localhost. Do you notice suddenly now the error message changed a little bit? Because before I didn't have a user called Dave. It just said, you can't connect with an empty user, even though that username existed. Now, that is a slight flaw in how MySQL does security, if you think about it. Because it's telling you that I don't know who this user is. Thus, it's not a valid user. Once I created a user that it knows about, it knows Dave is there. But I can't connect. Um, and whether I feed it a password or not would be irrelevant at this point. So I'll add in the parameter for password. Oops, made a space. And if I type in the password I created, it still says no. Glue to it, and that's okay. You can have a space or not. Um, depending on if you're scripting this to run from a batch file, like a like a bash script, uh, you don't want the spaces in there. Uh, same thing with the password. If you go dash p space and then the password, it, it thinks that first space is actually part of the password. Um, so for these kinds of things, it's the first letter is the argument, and then the rest of it's the the string. Um, in theory, that should still do it. And still not. I, I can't ask. The, the space doesn't make a difference. It'll make a difference on the password. All right. So. So far, I've created a user. User still can't connect. He doesn't have permissions to do Jack. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something that you're not supposed to do, <laughs> which is, remember earlier I was talking about give least permissions? I'm going to create, I'm going to allow Dave to do everything. So the command is grant all privileges. So you allow it to do everything on the database called Greenscape Landscaping. In actual fact, I'm going to change this to be a star. So that means it can, it can play with all tables inside green space landscaping to the user at a given host. MySQL is kind of cool, where I can create more than one user called Dave. But Dave coming from local hosts is allowed to do certain things, and Dave coming from somewhere on the network is allowed to do something different. And MySQL, that uses both halves of this to identify a user instead of just the first half. If you're using Postgres, it uses only the first half. This is actually out of the ordinary, to be honest. Yeah? It'll, it'll assume least. Well, that's not true. It'll assume order given. So if you give select, then you all, and then you give, uh, and then you revoke select, then you'll still be able to do insert updates and deletes. Uh, but if you go the other one where you grant all, then you revoke a bunch of them and you give them one again, it'll use the, it'll build it up in order. That also depends on what version of MySQL you're running. Fun times. But usually it assumes least privilege. At least in the last couple of versions, it's least privilege. And then after you've defined what privileges they're allowed to do, you do something called flush privileges. That forces the server to reread the permissions table. If you don't flush the permissions, I can type all the commands I want, and it's going to ignore them until I flush them. So I'm going to run these two commands, and there we go, grant all and flush. So I'm going to go back to my DOS prompt, which is gone missing in action, and I'm going to try to connect. And I'm just, I've lost my window a little bit here, there we go. And now, as you can see, I can connect. My machine happens to be running MariaDB as opposed to MySQL, but it's the same thing. And in here, I can do there. I can retrieve data. I can insert rows.
can't type today. I can delete data. I could go I can create a table and I can drop oops yeah I can drop a table right now Dave is superhuman inside the database the only thing he's not allowed to do is give permissions to someone else because I didn't add that extra clause at the end but he can create anything he can delete anything Basically, he can run and feather through the database. It's not a good scene. So, I just exited. Because one of the other funny things is the permissions don't always survive. They don't always reset properly unless you disconnect first. So, I'm going to nuke my user. I'm going to drop Dave, and I'm going to create Dave again. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change his permissions so that he's only allowed to select. Uh, let me just try to make this so that, there we go. So I'm going to drop my user because I want to start fresh like he doesn't exist, right? So it's easier to prove some of these concepts. I'm going to recreate them, same as it was, but this time he's only going to be allowed to select. And then I'm going to flush my privileges to make sure that the permissions are set up properly. And then we are going to um, try it. Go. No errors. Everything's happy. Let's go connect to my DOS window. I'm going to do this again. Hello. All right. So, so far, if you remember it, I set it up so permissions are only for select. I can select from departments. Previously, I did an insert, right? What's it saying now? It's saying, thou shall not succeed. You're not allowed to do this. It'll say permission denied, insert denied. That means this user can only select data. Cool. Um, what are the odds of him damaging the data in the database if he can only select? Zero chance. Because all he can do is read. Um, this is good for reporting services. Like if you've got a website that uh, that's available to the public that reports stats, um, you know, like gaming uh, standings. Back in the day when we used to play Unreal Tournament, we ran an Unreal Tournament server with stats that people could watch our stats. And as our team succeeded against other people, because we ran our own server, we could see the stats of all the different players that connected to us and they would was available on the internet. That user was made sure it only had read privileges because there was lots of people that tried to do bad things to your data because they're just like that. Um, so that's giving permissions just for insert, but I can't delete. So now what I can do is I can do this again and I can go grant insert and grant delete. And as you can see, I'm not going to delete the user. I'm just going to give them two more permissions on the same to everything. I'm going to select and run those. Um, now I'm going to go back to my DOS prompt. Let's see if the permissions took on the first on the on took uh, took immediately. Not allowed. And now I can insert because I gave them rights to insert. Um, but you notice I didn't give them rights to update. So if I go update departments set name equal to test2 where name is equal to test, not allowed to do that. But hey, I can, I can do this though. I 
I can delete, but I can't do an update because the permissions didn't allow it. So, so far, I've shown you permissions on a gross scale, as in I'm targeting the entire database, as in that user can see the entire database, they can update the entire database, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to nuke my user again and recreate him. Yoink. Dave is gone and he's back again. And then what I'm going to do is I am going to So I'm going to give Dave the rights to actually retrieve data out of only one table. At this point it seems a little petty, but you know, we're going to go for it. So Dave is allowed to only retrieve data out of the department's table. So I'm going to connect again. Look, I can select some departments. It works great. Let's go select star from clients. No, not allowed. Therefore, I created a user that can only see the contents of one table. Once again, that's handy if you have a user that, if you have a web app that connects to a database and its only purpose in life is retrieving data, you only give access to specific tables for that user needs. Um, for example, if you work for the government or you work for companies that have high security, often different users will have the ability to do different things and that, you know, it makes sense. Now, there's one more level permission that I discovered recently for MySQL and I thought it was kind of cool. So I'm going to nuke my, oh, shh. I'm going to nuke my user one more time. But this time I'm going to create him. And as you can see, I'm going to grant select and on a column called name. So the clients table, this user called Dave can only grab the names from the clients table. That's all they're allowed to retrieve. We want to talk about fine grained security. That's it. Column level security. I'm going to go run. No error messages. Why? Because I tried all this about two hours ago important to double check. So I'm going to try connecting one more time as Dave. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to try to select from something I'm not supposed to have rights to, which is departments. Surprise, I'm not allowed to connect to departments. Now I'm going to say, give me everything from clients. But I just set the permission. I just set the permission to, I'm pointing at my screen like you guys can see my finger. Um, I'm only giving name for the right to select the name. So I'm going to do select star from here. And I got a typo. Here's the error message you got. Select command denied to user for the column ID because they didn't give permissions for ID. Therefore, the user cannot see ID. So if I do a select name, which is the permission I finally gave it, there you go. Here's our first 100 users out of the database. That's about as fine grained as the security in the database server can get. It'll do the job for 90% of the people out there. Um, when you go to the second half of lab 6-7, what I just finished doing in the last 15 minutes is what you need. So that should take care of that for you guys. Um, I will post the commands next week because I want you to figure out how to do it. Otherwise, if I give you the commands, you're just going to change the name of the user and go paste, 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 paste. And it's gonna, I'm going to go, God, that looks an awful like, like what I gave them in class, which it would be. Um, but that's that. Um, any questions before I wrap up the recording? Going once, going twice, three and a half, all done.